Yes, my um, area of research is infant sleep. I've been studying infant sleep in Durham for nearly 30 years now. So my talk is going to give you a quick whistle-stop tour through what we know about the relationship between feeding and sleeping. So, as many of you, hopefully all of you, have figured out for yourselves, if nobody's told you, um, one of the key things about humans and human babies is that we're mammals. And our babies are mammal babies. And that comes with a whole suite of characteristics um, that affect both their feeding behavior and their sleeping behavior. So I'm going to just start by thinking about what being a mammal baby means for a human baby. So there are two types of mammal babies. We call them altricial and precocial. The top line here shows you what an altricial baby looks like in terms of its development in gestation. Then it's born, it's still relatively undeveloped, it can't see, it can't hear, it's usually hairless, um, and it spends its time in a nest while it finishes its development postnatally. And examples of altricial babies are things like kittens and puppies and you know, baby mice and baby hamsters, etc. And then there's another group of mammals that are referred to as precocial. They produce precocial infants. And they have much longer gestation periods. And by the time those babies are born, they're as well developed as these babies are when they leave the nest. Okay? So a lot of farmyard animals are precocial. Um, a lot of ungulates, so deer, um, antelopes, horses, zebras, um, a lot of primates, um, so monkeys, apes, and, well, we'll figure out about us in a minute. <laughs> so mammals who produce altricial infants use what we call a caching strategy, and some bright spark called these two strategies cache and carry. Um, <laughs> not every precocial mother carries her baby, but some of them do. So. so mammals who have altricial infants then use what we call a caching strategy. They have multiple babies in a litter. They make a nest and they leave them cached in that nest. And the nest provides them with safety and warmth. And the mother's job is to go off and forage for hours and hours and hours a day in order to produce enough milk to feed all of those babies. She comes back to them feeds them infrequently, maybe once or twice a day, and she produces milk that's got a high fat content because it has to satiate them for long periods. And basically all they're doing is sleeping and growing. Mammals who produce precocial infants use the carrying or following strategy. So they tend to produce one or two babies at a time. Those babies can walk or cling immediately after they're born. So they stay with their mother for safety and warmth while she forages, and therefore they can feed whenever they want to. So they feed frequently and on demand, often as frequently as hourly, and mothers of precocial species therefore produce milk that is low in fat because it doesn't have to satiate their babies for a long period, but high in sugar because their babies need energy to follow or to cling. Okay? Right, so now we can think about human babies. So where do human newborns fit into this pattern? Well, if we think about the state of our babies at birth, they can see, they can hear, they can call, they've got well-developed internal and sensory organs, so we call them precocial. They fit into the precocial pattern. And we as mothers also fit the precocial pattern because we produce milk that's low in fat and high in sugar, and our babies need to feed frequently. But what's different about human babies from other precocial infants is that we have poorly developed neuromuscular control at birth. We can't stand up and follow our mothers, and we can't even cling to them. We're not strong enough. We've got the grasping reflex, but we don't have the strength to keep ourselves attached to our mothers. And a lot, that is in large part because our brains are not as big relatively as other precocial mammals' babies' brains are at birth. So we have 25% of our brain, adult brain size at birth, but other primates have 50%.
And that's because we're not big enough, we're not big bodied enough to be able to sustain a pregnancy that would allow us to grow a baby with any larger brain. So we basically have our babies prematurely compared to other uh, mammals or other precocial mammals. And so our babies at birth are unusually neurologically developed. They don't have that ability to coordinate their limbs, etc. So human babies go through a period of what has been termed exterogestation. So that is gestation outside the womb. So during this period, and it tends to be about the first three or four months, they need close contact for warmth and security and for biological regulation. Newborn babies have difficulty stabilizing their temperature and their breathing independently sometimes and putting them in physical contact with a carer helps them with that. They don't develop their own circadian rhythm for several months or, well, it's developing, but you can't see any evidence of it for several months. So that means they can't sustain long periods of sleep. So sleeping in close proximity to a carer is actually what sleeping like a baby means for human babies. So if we think about how human babies sleep then, they sleep very different from us. They sleep very different from adults and from their parents. They need much more sleep, but the amount of sleep that babies need is hugely variable. We'll get onto that in a minute. Human babies don't sleep exclusively at night because they don't have this circadian rhythm, this day-night cycle. They sleep all around the clock. And they don't sleep continuously. They wake every two to three hours. They also fall asleep differently than adults do. So when we fall asleep, we go quickly into the deepest phase of sleep. And then we gradually come out of that and spend a little bit of time in, in REM sleep or dreaming sleep, and then we go back into deep sleep. And as the night goes on, we spend less time in deep sleep and more time in, in REM sleep. Babies, when they fall asleep, fall into what the, the baby equivalent of REM sleep. We call it active sleep. Their brain's not doing exactly what we do in REM sleep yet, but they fall into active sleep first, and they're in active sleep for about 20 minutes before they progress into deeper stages of sleep. So that explains why if a baby falls asleep on you and you try to move them too quickly and put them down, they're going to wake up quick, easily because they're in a light stage of sleep. You have to wait until they've gotten into that floppy baby stage and you know that they're in deep sleep. You could tie them in a knot and they wouldn't wake up. <laughs> then you can move them and they probably won't notice it. Babies also have shorter sleep cycles than adults. So their sleep cycles are 45 minutes to 60 minutes long, whereas ours are 90 minutes long. And it takes them until uh, you know, close to the end of the first year before they start to get longer sleep cycles. And they also experience much more active sleep. And that's the, the sleep when the brain is processing information that it's acquired during the day. And babies spend much more time in active sleep processing information than they ever will at any other point in their lives. So 50% of a, baby's sleep, a newborn baby's sleep time is REM sleep or active sleep. And then it de de decreases over time. Okay, so that's what's happening with babies' sleep. Now let's have a look at how much sleep babies need, or maybe we should say how much sleep babies get. So this is a, this is a graph um, from um, a systematic review that was compiled by Barbara Galland in 2012. And she wanted to look at what research studies had found in terms of how much sleep babies took at different ages out of 24 hours. So what she's plotted here are each, each blob and bar is a, a, an individual study. She's divided them into uh, the different age groups that these studies were conducted. And you can see that there are a large number of studies that looked at babies between birth and two months. 
The blobs are the average amount of sleep that babies in each study got in 24 hours. And the bars show the range, so what the individual babies in that study who made up that average, kind of how much they slept. So what you can see is that in the first two months, baby sleep is all over the place. So the study averages aren't anywhere close to each other, and the ranges go from 22 hours out of 24 to 8 hours out of 24. And these were all normal babies. They didn't have any medical complications, etc. So these were just studies of normal babies um, and how much sleep they obtained. At three months, you can see it's still quite variable. By the time you get to about 12 months, the averages are starting to become a bit more consistent and the ranges are starting to get a bit narrower. So it takes a long time for babies to kind of start consistently sleeping similar amounts. So what this illustrates is the futility of comparing one baby with another in terms of its sleep behavior, because babies are hugely variable, and comparing them is not helpful at all. This next graph is sort of zooming this one out so that you're looking at the whole of the first 16 years of life. So here you can see this sort of illustrates what's going on compared with the first year, compared with what happens through early childhood, middle childhood, and adolescence. So our sleep habits or our sleep patterns become more and more consistent as we move towards adulthood. Um, but you can see that in that first year, the range between, you know, the, the second percentile and the 98th percentile is massive. <coughs> so when somebody tells you that they think their baby isn't, isn't sleeping enough or is sleeping too much, you can say to them, so long as they're within 22 and 8 to 8 hours, um, <laughs> that, that's all quite normal. Where did our ideas about what baby sleep should look like come from? Well, unsurprisingly, they came from the 1950s. And the studies that are quoted the most in pediatric textbooks are studies that were done in the 1950s and the 1960s. And this one is a classic, oh, I, I turned my slide over. There you go. This one by Moore and Ucko from 1957 is a classic one that you see cited all over the place in, in parenting books, in pediatric textbooks, as I said. And that's because Moore and Ucko set out to define what normal infant sleep was. They said their study aimed to define normal infant sleep. They meant in the UK. They didn't say that because, you know, everybody thinks that where they live is the be-all and end-all of everything. But they meant what's normal, what's normal for the UK in the 1950s. They studied 160 babies in order to do this. And they came up with a definition of what sleeping through the night would mean in their study. And babies were sleeping through the night if their parents reported no crying or fussing from midnight until 5 a.m. Is that what you all think sleeping through the night is? 70% <laughs> of the babies in their study began to meet this criteria, that is sleeping through the night, midnight, 5 a.m., at three months of age. And what gets reported in most of the baby sleep guides is, your baby should be able to sleep through the night from three months of age. But that's meaningless if you don't know that sleeping through the night means midnight to five. And it's also meaningless if you don't know the other part of their data, which was that half of that 70% who started doing that stopped doing it the following month. <laughs> because infant sleep development is not a slow, gradual climb up an incline. It's a lot more like a roller coaster. Babies will start sleeping for longer, and then they'll start night waking again, and then they'll start sleeping for longer again, and then they'll start night waking again. So anybody who's got the expectation that once their baby starts to put some 
sleep cycles together and sleeps for three or four hours, that it's only going to get better from here is a, you know, just going to encounter a nasty surprise. So we need to remember as well, as well as what doesn't get reported about Moore and Oco's studies, we also need to remember the context in which they were done. So the majority of babies in, 19, in the 1950s weren't fed human milk. The majority of them were put down to sleep on their stomachs. The majority of them slept in a separate room from their parents, all of which is very different from what parents are encouraged to do today. So breastfed babies, babies sleeping on their backs and babies sleeping in the same room as their parents are going to have different sleep patterns. And the big thing about being in a separate room is that if your data are collected by parental self-report, the parents don't know whether the baby's asleep. They only know whether it was quiet or not, whether it signaled for them. So we need to, we need to not take this with a pinch of salt. They reported their data accurately, but the way in which it's been passed on and um, interpreted um, by others um, means that we get quite a skewed picture of what we think baby sleep should be. So as a consequence of all of that, most pediatric and popular knowledge about baby sleep maturation is based upon these old studies of formula-fed babies sleeping alone. And as a consequence of that, many parents now think that if a baby wakes at night past the third month, that's somehow problematic. But for breastfed babies, we know that that's normal and expectable. It's actually expectable for all babies, but particularly for breastfed babies, because breastfed babies digest breast milk quickly, and they may therefore feel hungry again in two to three hours and are ready for another feed, especially in those early days. And many parents hear that one way to solve this problem of babies needing to feed regularly through the night is, of course, to supplement their baby's diet with either formula or formula with some kind of thickener, like baby rice or cereal, that will encourage their baby to kind of start sleeping longer, what we call settling, early settling. And this phrase, early uh, settling, is, is used to refer to the phase when the baby starts to fall asleep quickly into deep sleep and to stay asleep for that midnight to 5 a.m. stretch. It's been an early parenting goal or a desirable parenting goal for the past 50 to 60 years. To get your baby to settle early is a sign of an effective parent. And it was co not, no surprise, really, that it kind of was, happened coincidentally with the increase in the use of formula. So we need to be aware of that and able to challenge those ideas when you, they come up in the community. So talking about the ideas that you hear about infant sleep uh, and feeding in the community, one of the things that we were interested to do was find out what mothers understood about the relationship between feeding and sleeping. And when I started working in this area, we did some interview studies in the late 90s where the key thing that we heard again and again was that Mothers had quit breastfeeding in sometime in the first two or three months because the nighttime sleep disruption was too much for them to handle. The baby was too demanding. The baby wanted to feed too much in the night. The mother wasn't getting enough sleep. The dad wasn't able to help. And all of those things sort of meant that putting them on formula meant that they got better sleep. And we really, what we wanted to know in 2000 and 12 and 13 when we did this study was, did that still pertain? Was that still what uh, mothers felt? <coughs> so we conducted this um, focus group study with seven groups of adolescent and adult mothers, um, a mix of ethnicities. We did the focus groups between Newcastle and Leicester. Um, they all had babies under a year old. They were a mix of breastfeeding and formula feeding participants. We had between six and nine in each group. And these are the sorts of things that the mothers talked about when they talked about the way in which they understood feeding and sleeping. 
So we got quite a few who said what we had heard 20 years previously. With breastfeeding, you don't know how much they're actually having. If they're hungry, they could wake up like two hours later or something. So here the mum is interpreting the fact that breastfeeding babies wake frequently to feed because the breast milk is, isn't filling them up and they're, they're getting hungry quicker. Formula and sleep is the key, said another one. Breastfeeding and sleep isn't happening. So there was still this pervasive idea that, that if you were going to breastfeed your baby, you weren't going to get any sleep. But we also start, were starting to hear a different view. And one of the mums in one of the focus groups put it this way, she said, I think it's quite an old-fashioned notion that they need formula to sleep better. My mother-in-law and my auntie, who were of that older generation, they're like, he's not sleeping through, you need a bottle, you need to give him formula, formula and solids. I was told that at three months and she left. I was like, no, I don't think he does. So there were clearly mums in the focus group study in 2012-13 uh, who was pushing back on the sort of dominant cultural idea about the relationship between feeding and sleep. And these ideas that, pair, that mothers had about the way in which how you fed your baby affected their sleep also extended to the way in which you should um, interact with them at night. So one set of sort of um, expectations that we heard regularly was summed up like this, sir, quote, I've always had all of them in a routine. I believe a baby fits around your routine, you don't fit around theirs. And that's sort of one end of the spectrum, yeah? The other end of the spectrum that we heard was like this. Babies sleep and when, they, when they need it and forget it. You've got to work around them, and that's all there is to it. As often as she wakes is when she wakes. So, you know, they're talking about the exact same thing in two diametrically opposed ways. And those, <coughs> excuse me, those ideas that parents have about the way in which you interact with a baby, especially around nighttime, affected the strategies that they used for coping with baby's night waking. So this first one that I'm going to show you was one of the teenage mums in our group. And she said, I was getting no sleep at all, whatsoever. So after six weeks, so this means when the baby's six weeks old, I asked my mum what she'd done with us, and she says, like, do the tough love thing, which she meant let the baby cry out. So I tried it, and I stuck it out, and after two weeks, she slept all night. That, to me, is heartbreaking, that she would put a six-week-old baby on its own for two weeks until it gave up calling for her in the night. But for her, that was about the baby fits around you, you don't fit around them, and this was the strategy that she'd been advised to follow, and as far as she was concerned, it had worked. At the other end of the spectrum, one of the other mothers described, if I have a night where he wants to nurse a lot, I'll put him in bed with me, and I'll just sleep. And he just latches on when he wants to, and it doesn't really interrupt my sleep a great deal. Now, we've heard about this for many, many years. This has been one of the main focuses of our research, the sort of relationship between breastfeeding and bed sharing. But these mothers also come in for an awful lot of criticism in some quarters for having their babies in bed. So, you know, in some respects, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You can't do, you, you know, everybody comes in for criticism. Nobody can do anything right. So what we found in our focus group study then was that popular wisdom in the UK tightly links breastfeeding with inadequate nighttime sleep. And mothers are frequently told by their friends and their family to give their baby formula or formula and solid food to promote longer sleep. The nature of infant sleep is understood differently by each group, as was its relationship to feeding method. And the breastfeeding mums viewed the fragmentary nature of infant sleep as natural, and they had to somehow cope with it, find a way to cope with it, while the mothers who were formula feeding felt that it was a problem and their job was to somehow fix it. 
and the strategies and the approaches that are used to promote infant and maternal sleep in each group were un aligned with this underlying perception of how infant sleep works. You either make your baby sleep the way you want it, or you modify your behavior in order to cope with your baby's sleep somehow. Or if you do neither of those things, I think you, you just lose your mind. So, hang on a sec. So what's the data say? What's the research evidence about how much sleep babies who are fed with different strategies uh, get? So for a long time, nobody was really addressing this question head on. You could only find data in studies that were looking at breastfeeding and sleep for other reasons and happened to report how much sleep the babies got. So this is an example of one of those studies. In 2010, Liat Tikotsky was looking at the relationship between infant sleep and growth. And as a consequence of that, she reported about infant sleep and breastfeeding for 96 six-month-old babies. And the nice thing about her study was that the sleep was measured using those little movement sensors that you wear around your wrist, or you can put them around babies' ankles rather than relying on maternal reports. And what she found was that breastfeeding was correlated with more fragmented sleep, that is, you woke more if you were a breastfeeder, but not actually with less sleep. You got the same amount of sleep as the formula feeding mums did, they just got it in bigger blocks. In this study, they didn't say anything about where the babies were sleeping, so we can't say whether uh, bed sharing kind of helped those breastfeeding mums to, to sleep more or not. But there was another study, this was a big one that was done in China, so um, this was a maternal report study because you've got over 3,000 babies in it, so you're not going to have enough actigraphs to do actigraphy on them. But they looked at <coughs> the sleep of 3,016 babies aged 0 to 6 months, and found that breastfed babies actually had greater nighttime sleep, nine hours, more sleep frequency, so that's the same as sleep fragmentation, so more awake and asleep, awake and asleep, and higher rates of bed sharing, which is what we found in all of our studies, that breastfeeding babies are more likely to bed share. So one of the things that we wanted to do in our research was look at this issue of actual amount of sleep versus maternal perception of amount of sleep for babies. So this is a complicated graph that I'm going to show you, but in this study, we were looking at 50 mother-baby pairs, and this was done by one of my postdocs, Alana Rudzik, and she wanted to compare exclusively breastfeeding babies versus exclusively formula-feeding babies and look at their sleep trajectory over time. So this graph shows total sleep time. So this is between 6 p.m. and 8 a.m. How much sleep did these babies get? She studied them at four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 14 weeks, 16 weeks, and 18 weeks. And the graphs show mother's report Firstly, for exclusively breastfed, then exclusively formula fed, then actigraphy for exclusively breastfed, and then actigraphy for exclusively formula fed. So the gray bars are the objective data, and the darker bars are the subjective data, and it's breastfed first and formula fed second. Okay? So you can see at the beginning, all of the babies were getting around about eight and a half to nine hours sleep a night at, in week four. Similar in week six, but then in week eight, 10, and 12, they start to diverge. If you look across all of the gray columns, they're not that different until you get to week 18, where the breastfed babies slept for about an hour more, or maybe more than an hour, an hour and a half more than the formula-fed babies. But other than that, total amount of sleep is not significantly different. However, mother's perceptions 
of their baby's sleep start to increase above what the babies are actually getting, but for the formula feeding group, increase more. So the formula feeding mums are reporting that their babies are getting about an hour's more sleep than they actually were. <coughs> now that's not huge in terms of total sleep time, but the other thing that we calculated was the baby's longest sleep period. So in the night, what was the baby's longest period of sleep? And here you can see everybody overestimated what their baby's longest sleep period was. So the actigraphy shows that the baby's longest sleep period didn't really change from four weeks to 16 weeks, and then it starts to differentiate here at week 18. But you can see both groups of mums overestimate a bit, and then that bit gets bigger and bigger, and then it starts to separate, and it gets huger and huger. So as time goes on, all mums are overestimating what their baby's longest sleep period is. That is, we don't know how frequently our babies are waking. But if you're breastfeeding, you're a bit more accurate, not a huge amount, but you're a bit more accurate than if you're not breastfeeding. Okay? But this, this suggests that when, when we're having conversations with our friends at baby groups about, you know, how much does your baby sleep at night? How long does your baby sleep for without waking you at night? We haven't got a clue, really. We're all, you know, we're all, we're all making it up as we go along. So, so you know, that was really the take-home message from that, that study was that maternal self-report is useless as a measure of actual infant sleep. We don't know how much our babies are sleeping. But of course, the other thing that's really important is how much do sleep do mothers get? Because it's mothers who make decisions about their baby's feeding. So really, it doesn't matter that much how much sleep the babies are getting if the mothers perceive their own sleep to be too disruptive to be able to cope with, then they're going to try something different. So there have been a few studies that have looked at this. One of the first ones that's widely quoted uh, is this one from 2007 by Doan in the States. And they found that mothers who, who exclusively breastfed at night got about 40 minutes more sleep than mothers who gave their babies formula. And they argued that this was to do with the fact that actually getting up and making a bottle and feeding it, etc., was much more disruptive to your sleep than bringing your baby into bed, feeding it, and whether you put it back or kept it with you, um, you got more sleep anyway. Building on that, um, Holly Montgomery Downs, also in the States, did a more detailed study of the impact of breastfeeding on maternal sleep. And she looked at subjective reports and objective measures and different sleepiness scales. And she's got a hu huge number of graphs in her paper, so I'm not going to show them all to you. But this is one that's particularly useful, I think. So in this set of graphs, she's done similar to what we did, looked at babies at 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12 weeks, or mothers with babies of those ages. And she's got three bars in her data. The first one is exclusively breastfed, the dark one in the middle is exclusively formula fed, and the stripy one on the right hand side is mixed fed. So in the first graph she's looking at total sleep time, so this is mum's total sleep time for each postpartum week by each feeding method, and there's no difference. The next one is sleep efficiency. Sleep efficiency is how much sleep you get out of the total amount of time you're in bed. So again, Sleep efficiency increases over time as babies get older, mums get a bit more sleep, but the only difference was this one at 10 weeks between formula fed and mixed fed. And the third one is sleep fragmentation. So again, this decreases as babies get older, but again, there's no difference in the amount of sleep mums are getting by the different feed types. So there's a common belief then that Breastfed babies wake frequently to feed, or because breastfed babies wake frequently to feed, mums wake frequently as well, and so both get less sleep. But the studies don't bear that out. They show that breastfeeding mums and babies get the same or more sleep than formula feeding dyads. 
that they return to sleep more quickly or they sleep during feeds. But the still sleep fragmentation um, experienced by breastfeeding mums, and that is what we subjectively experience as poorer quality sleep, the fact that we're woken several times in the night. Okay, so thinking about how we cope with that then. This was one of the earliest studies that we did um, in North Tees in the northeast of England. We recruited 253 families with newborn babies on the postnatal ward of the local hospital, and we had them keep sleep diaries. Um, so it was self-report data. It was before we ever um, had actigraphs in our lab. Um, we had them keep sleep diaries for seven consecutive days, and then we interviewed them at the end of the first and third month. And what we were interested in was where the babies were sleeping. <coughs> and what we found was that the breastfed babies were much more likely to be in their parents' bed for at least some of the night. So we had a small portion of our pie chart who were what we called habitual bed sharers. That was, they were in their parents' bed all night, every night. But the vast majority slept in a cot some of the time and then came into bed for one of the feeds in the middle of the night and then stayed there for the rest of the night. So we call that combination bed sharing. And then we also had some in the breastfeeding group who occasionally brought their baby into bed when it was unsettled or unwell or whatever. So about two thirds of the breastfeeding group did some bed sharing. The formula feeding group, about just over a quarter did some bed sharing and it was equally split between combination and occasional bed sharing. When we look at the difference between babies at different age groups, we found that the, the majority of the bed sharing happened as the babies were younger. So about 50%, nearly 50% bed shared in the first month and it dropped down to about a third in the third month. And one of the things that used to happen when I first started talking about this data was everybody would go, that's an awful lot of people bringing their babies into bed. I'm sure they don't do that where we are. Uh, I think there must be something odd going on in, this, in, the, in the place where you're collecting your data. So I got together with a statistician from the KESDI study, which was the big case control study on SIDS that had been done in the UK in the 90s. And I asked him to look at his control data, that is the families whose babies didn't die. Um, because I knew that they'd collected data on where those babies were on any given night. And using the same um, cutoffs of age, he came up with almost identical figures. So we published this back in 2004 to demonstrate that actually bed sharing was an issue that, that parents needed information about, and lots of, lots of parents brought their babies into bed, and we should be talking about it. When we broke the data down by um, feed type, we found that, ba that babies who were breastfed for a month or more, 72% of them bed shared at least some of the time, compared with 38% of the formula-fed babies. So one of the subsequent things that I wanted to find out in our research was why. Why were parents bringing their babies into bed? They weren't all doing it for breastfeeding. There were other reasons, so what, what were they? And what we found was that most parents don't anticipate bed sharing before they have their baby. In fact, many of them told us they would never do that. But a month after having their baby, a lot of them were doing it. And parents who regularly did it gave us multiple reasons. They talked about nighttime breastfeeding, as we've mentioned, and it made, also made regular sleep disruption easier to cope with. They figured out that it calmed and settled their babies it reduced the amount of crying. It reduced their sleep deprivation. There were also some parents who had gone back to work and they found that ha sleeping with their baby at night sort of made up for that contact that they felt that they lost during the day. Fathers have particularly talked about this, that it felt good to be in close contact with their baby at night when they weren't around during the day. Some of them uh, brought their baby into bed because it reassured them that they were able to monitor the baby constantly or when they were ill. 
Some families brought their babies into bed because it was part of a familial or a cultural belief that that is just how you take care of babies. So it's tradition. And some did it because they didn't have any other options, because they were living in a place where they had no space for a cot or somewhere else for the baby to sleep, or they couldn't afford one, or it, they were doing it accidentally. They'd, f they'd fallen asleep, say, on the sofa. So there were a wide range of reasons why parents bring their babies into bed. And our study was followed up a few years later by um, another systematic review, this time of all of the studies that had looked at reasons for bed sharing. So ours are included in there, but there were actually 34 studies that had mentioned reasons for bed sharing by this point. And the themes that they came up with in the systematic review, many of them mirrored what we'd heard a bit previously. Is that two minutes left? Oh, I better get on a bit faster. Um, breastfeeding and comforting and more sleep and monitoring and bonding but they also in the states came up with things to do with the environment like vermin and gunshots and things and that was why parents bed shared and maternal instinct came up as well but breastfeeding was the most commonly cited reason um, <coughs> and one of the things that makes um, bed sharing particularly important for breastfeeding mums is the fact that it interacts with our physiology and it enhances our ability to produce milk um, in the first few weeks. So one of the studies that we have done is to randomize mums and babies on the postnatal ward into different sleep conditions and video the number of times they breastfed during the night. So I can't tell you about this in great detail since I'm running out of time. But what we found was mums and babies who were randomly allocated to be in close contact, either in bed together or with a sidecar crib attached to their bed, breastfed, attempted to feed or successfully fed twice as frequently in the nights as the mums who had their babies in a cot by the bed. And this is important because frequent feeding in the early postnatal period leads to increased prolactin production. So your prolactin levels go up every time you feed. Your prolactin level, you have a prolactin surge every time the baby goes to the nipple. To actually get your milk to come in, your prolactin levels have to reach a certain threshold. So if you are frequently feeding, instead of in between each um, prolactin surge, it goes back down to zero, you can keep it rising. So it'll go up, then it'll fall back down, but if you feed again, it'll go back up again, then it'll fall back down, then it'll go back up again, and you'll get to that threshold quicker. And then your milk comes in more copiously, it comes in sooner, and you feel more confident in your ability to be able to feed your baby. So. What we found was that rooming in the normal kind of postnatal care was better, of course, than taking babies away and putting them in a nursery, which they used to do before a baby-friendly initiative. But for breastfeeding initiation, actually having no barrier between the mum and the baby, having them in a sidecar crib or in the bed was actually better for initiating breastfeeding. Um, and not only that, but when mums and babies went home, this is, um, we had about 1,200 mums and babies took part in a study. All were breastfeeding when they left the hospital. And we followed them up and asked them every week what they were doing for feeding and where the baby was sleeping. And the ones who were bed sharing in the first 13 weeks were twice as likely to still be breastfeeding at six months than the ones who weren't bed sharing in the first six uh, 13 weeks, so the, the drop-off was quite dramatic in the first 13 weeks in the ones who didn't bed share. So to me, that suggests that not only does breastfeed, it, does bed sharing help mothers initiate breastfeeding, it also helps them sustain it. I was going to talk to you in detail about how mothers and babies bed share and the position that they sleep in, etc., but I'm not going to have time to do that. So I am going to say that there is one more thing we need to think about, and that is 
the relationship between breastfeeding and SIDS and how bed sharing fits into all of this. <coughs> so the take home message from this slide is that breastfeeding reduces the chance of baby's chance of SIDS by 50% if the baby is breastfed for two months. So any, any amount of breastfeeding over two months, 50% reduction in the rate of SIDS. The relationship between bed sharing and SIDS illustrates that bed sharing increases SIDS by about 2.89 times, or the odds ratio is 2.89. That means this is all babies who bed share. It doesn't just mean breastfeeding babies. But for the general population, um, bed sharing increases the risk of SIDS. But the data from the UK, the most recent data, this was published in 2014, demonstrate that it's hazardous bed sharing that is associated with that increased risk of SIDS. So if we've got breastfeeding mums who are bed sharing, we need to be talking to them about how to do it as safely as possible because it's bed sharing on, or sleeping with a baby on a sofa if you've been intoxicated by drugs and alcohol, if you're a smoker, or if your baby was low birth weight or premature that makes it hazardous. The NICE guidance now talks about the fact that health professionals need to discuss bed sharing with families so there are two documents that were produced in 2021, the postnatal care in evidence about the benefits and harms and the postnatal care evidence about co-sleeping risk factors. You can find both on the NICE website. But basically they've boiled them down to a quality standard that says that parents must be given advice. One of the ways in which the quality um, assurance um, for a hospital is judged is by whether parents are given advice about safer practices for bed sharing at each routine postnatal contact. So all families should be getting information about safer bed sharing practices, not just being told not to do it. There are lots of um, resources available on the web that you can um, read if you want to kind of learn about more of this. One of the most recent ones is not here. No, it's not, okay. There's one by the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, a protocol on breastfeeding and bed sharing. If you want to know where it is, I'll send it to you. But the UNICEF um, Co-Sleeping and SIDS um, is a very useful resource. You can download that from their website. And the Lullaby Trust um, Safe Asleep guidance now, I'm sure you've all seen it, but it now includes information about how to have a discussion about what is safe and what is not safe with regards to bed sharing. So that's the standard guidance in the UK at the moment. So to summarize, huh. <coughs> let me summarize looking at the microphone, not at the back of the screen. Okay, so human babies then are born with a particular set of needs that don't easily fit with contemporary adult life. But huge advances have been made in understanding the relationship between breastfeeding and sleep, and as a consequence, understanding how mothers cope with nighttime infant care. And what we found particularly is that mothers use bed sharing as a coping strategy for nighttime nursing and for sleep disturbance, and that this is associated with greater breastfeeding duration. In the UK, the approach to SIDS an infant sleep safety has moved away from that instructional model where everybody was told just don't do it to an educational model where people are expected to have an informed conversation about um, their particular case. So parents with babies who are at high risk for SIDS due to prenatal smoke exposure or premature birth need to have that explained to them about why their baby's safe sleep needs are greater than anybody else's. And all parents need to have targeted information on safe bed sharing because most will do it. Some will do it accidentally. They won't think that they're going to do it. But if they've had that conversation, it might remind them about the safety. So we need to educate all parents about the possibility of falling asleep with their baby and the hazards of accidental and unplanned co-sleeping. And you can find a lot of the information that I've talked about today on our website, which I hope you all know where it is anyway, but just in case you forgot, there it is. Thank you very much.